if there is any temptation out there to let this story just sit as a rote, familiar opening to the Christmas story, I'm inviting you to resist. Resist with everything you have, that way, the way you've heard it, the way it sat with you, because what we are reading here is scandalous and improper. It is scandalous and improper. It is dangerous. And in our 21st century Western uh, wealthy expression of Christianity, it doesn't seem so. But in first century Palestine, everything that we just read is scandalous and improper. The idea of a young pregnant girl, probably as young as 13, the idea of a young girl pregnant deciding to visit her relative or traveling alone is unusual, to say the least, not only given the status of women at the time, but the dangers of just travel. Even full-grown men would find the journey to hill country dangerous. You didn't do it. So already Luke is alerting us to something that Mary is operating outside the norms and understanding of what is supposed to be happening. She is operating outside the norms and understandings of the current religious, political, and economic age. Let's not domesticate what is happening here. Mary and Elizabeth are raising eyebrows. One girl too young to be pregnant and one postmenopausal woman too old to be pregnant. God is doing something weird here. Let's not domesticate it. This is not the way things are supposed to happen. And while for the world something scandalous and improper is indeed going on, for these women and today I hope from now on for us, God is moving in a dramatic and profound way. God is up to something. And boy, I tell you, when God is up to something, you better hold on to your seat. Hold on. Because it's not going to flow the way we think it should. You see, God is acting and responding, revealing God's self to women. Women, let's name it. These are women at this time, lowly, ignored, oppressed, not worthy to be listened to. And yet, and yet, God acts. And so I invite you to let this story break through our cultural and religious conventional wisdom to see how God is about to interrupt time and history. With the world as it is, the only thing the faithful, people like Mary and Elizabeth, the only thing they have to hold on to is God's promise to do something. And I, you know, again, God is going to do something. We don't know what the do is, but the only thing that faithful people have who are, God do something. Israel held on to that promise. It is a promise as old as the side of the Mount Sinai. A promise that they heard in the prophecies of deliverance from Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Zechariah, Micah. Name the, the prophet. And the promise has been uttered. A promise that the psalmist sing about. Go and pick a psalm. And God's promise will ring out in the lyrics. It is a promise. A promise to do a new thing. The promise about a new heaven and a new earth. A promise about a new Jerusalem. But as time went on, as the world grew more unjust and more violent, more unequal, some began to wonder if the promise would be fulfilled. But in this story of Mary's visitation with Elizabeth, we encounter faithful people actively, actively waiting and preparing and participating in the fulfillment of God's promise. We find John, even before he was born, believing in the fulfillment of what God promised. We find Elizabeth 
whose own husband doubted that God could act so powerfully and was struck mute by an angel because of his refusal to believe. But even Elizabeth, when her husband couldn't, Elizabeth believed in the fulfillment of the promise. Mary, who willingly accepted God's call, believed in the fulfillment of what God promised. It is not easy to hold on to the promise of salvation when everything around you just seems to be going against you. When the powerful seem to keep getting more powerful, when there seems to be no end to Caesar's control, when Rome seems to get in, doesn't get any less, less weaker, it's hard to believe in something like a new heaven and a new earth. The possibilities of the future look bleak and, and, and history appeared to be at an end. Nothing could change. Elizabeth and her husband, Zechariah, previously believed that since they could not bear a child, their future was foreclosed. And for many who were suffocating under the weight of political, economic, and religious power and control, they could not imagine anything new or different. It couldn't happen. On the other side, the powerful and the elitist, oh, this, this, they couldn't imagine anything new or different either because everything was going well for them. It was the best of all possible worlds. This is it. This is the way things are. How many times have we heard that this is just the way the world works? This is it. This is how it goes. But Mary and Elizabeth, with their miracle pregnancies and their faithful demonstration of discipleship, are heralds of something different. They are, they are examples that the world, that this is just the way the world is, is, is not quite true when it comes to God. They are, they are the first to receive God's radical act of salvation. They are the bearers of the truth that God has not forgotten those who live on the margins. Whatever else Mary and Elizabeth may have previously thought about their situation, about their place in the world, about women, about how they are going to live, when they both accepted God's movement in their lives in a real way, they are no longer ambivalent. God is about to cut up up in here. They could have been afraid, they could have, they could have shrank from it. But no, no, Mary and Elizabeth, Mary and keep that in your mind during this holiday season. Mary and Elizabeth, they accepted God's movement in their life. Just like John, they are Advent folk. They are ready. One theologian said, at Advent is a time to break out of lukewarm indifference to opt for the coming newness of God. John, Elizabeth, and Mary all opt for God's newness. John, Elizabeth, and Mary have imagination. John, Elizabeth, and Mary know that the world isn't going to be this way always. How do you know, Pastor? Because Luke tells us that the baby jumped in Elizabeth's womb upon hearing Mary's voice. And then Elizabeth testifies without doubt or hesitation that Mary is the mother of the Lord, an unpregnant, a pregnant, unwed child who should have been stoned according to the rules, should have been hurled out into the public square and stoned to death because she's pregnant. Mary testifies that this is the mother of my Lord, and she wasn't meaning Caesar. And then Mary, Mary replies in her own testimony. She wasn't being modest. Oh, don't say that about me. It wasn't that false modesty. Oh, don't say that. 
No, Mary responds to Elizabeth's testimony by testifying her own self. And she begins to sing a song, a song of her own about the salvation to come. She begins to testify in song about the arrival of God's justice, the reversal of the conditions of the poor and the powerful, the overturning of the status quo of oppression and dispossession. When everyone else languished in doubt about the promise, when ambivalence kept people tethered to the current religious and political and economic status quo, when others resign themselves to the world continuing in its chaotic and disordered way, it was the faithfulness and the discipleship of a young girl and an old woman that bore witness to God's love. Mary and Elizabeth were the living embodiments of the good news that God so loved the world. God loved the world. They begin to testify with their lives, with their their extended bellies, with their testimonies. They begin to tell that God is and remains a God of loving kindness. That, That here in their lives, there is no limit to God's love for God's people. God's love is not an empty promise. Even when the world around them is chaotic, God's love is a promise fulfilled. It's a love that looked down on that poor girl and favored her with a role to play in God's purpose. It is a love that was born in the form of a baby, poor and anonymous, in a manger in a small town in occupied tor- territory. It is a love that manifests unconditionally such that all of creation stands ready to see the salvation of God. What is happening here is God's love alive. God's love is alive. God's love is alive. Now, and before I go any further, let me talk about this love I'm talking about. Because see, sometimes when I said love, I guarantee you, we were thinking about that warm, fuzzy little feeling called love. You know, the one where you get the piece of paper and write, my love and love. No. No. Before we go any further, let me tell you what this love is like because it's right there in the story. Again, that's why I said this story is so dangerous. It's right there in the story. Elizabeth models that love in a very specific way. Despite the scandal of an unwed girl being pregnant, especially given the times and the expectations of temple faithfulness and purity and shame and honor, Elizabeth does not judge Mary or reject Mary or accuse Mary. How many times have we had someone, when someone who's pregnant comes before them, you are a sinner, get out. Elizabeth did not do that. Elizabeth did not reject Mary. And here's what I'm telling you. Mary, according to the rules, was supposed to be hauled out into the public square and stoned to death. And if it was going to be someone, you couldn't protect her. And if you join her side, you will lose your honor. Mary does not care. Elizabeth does not care about honor. Elizabeth doesn't care about safety. Elizabeth doesn't care about anything other than God fulfilling God's promise. So when Mary, that that unwed pregnant girl, comes there, Mary is, is, is not rejected or thrown away. Elizabeth says, here is the mother of my Lord. It took courage to do that. It took love to do that. It took faith to do that. That's the kind of love I'm talking about. The love that could almost get you killed because you love someone when someone told you to hate them. That's the kind of love I'm talking about. The love that isn't sentimental and and warm fuzzy. It's the one that stands out and says, I'm going to take all of the heat for you. I'm going to take all the burden with you. I'm going to stand with you if everybody else leaves you. That's the love that God manifests when Elizabeth and Mary met that day. That's the law. And so, so this, isn't, this isn't a passive love. This isn't a sentimental love. Isn't, isn't it one way to tell you, I'm saying this in love. You know what I'm talking about. Let a Mary show up to somebody today and they'll say, you need to get help. I'm saying this in love. 
No, no, no. Love, love, love is unconditional. Love takes the heat. Love walks with those who need you. It's love alive, literally and figuratively. And if there is one word that I think that provides both the call and the inspiration of Advent and Christmas, it is love. Not a sentimental love that we attempt to capture in the greeting cards. I like the greeting cards, but love I'm talking about can't be captured there. It's not the love that, that, that comes in the perfect gift. Oh, I enjoy those perfect gifts, but that's not the love I'm talking about. I'm talking about a love that breaks through the coldness and the cynicism and the disconnection of the world. A love that actually encounters all that attacks our worth, our dignity, our humanness, our very divine life connected to the divine. That's the kind of love I'm talking about. I'm talking about a love whereby our very connection to God, our experience of God's unconditional love become what motivates us and animates us to show up in the world loving and serving and doing justice when it may be easier not to. That's the kind of love I'm talking about. A love alive that brings life instead of stealing it. That brings life instead of taking it. Life, life not just to us, but to everyone we encounter, every person we touch, love. And take some time as we go through this holiday season, take some time to reconsider the power of love, that deep abiding love that God has for God's creation, that unconditional love emanating from God from the very beginning of creation when God formed all of it. Love that could not be contained, that it overflowed and we were created. Couldn't be contained. That kind of love. Remember it, reconsider it. Not as a form of transaction or as a means to an end, but an end to itself. What do you mean, pastor? What are you doing to th- this, this holiday season? I'm loving, that's the gift I give. I'm just loving as much as I possibly can. That's the gift. That's the gift I keep giving. An end in itself. Love whereby God's love looks upon creation with the deep commitment to bring us life and renewal, a love whereby God incarnated God's self into Jesus to show us what love alive actually looks like, that God would choose to be Emmanuel, God with us. Oh, I, let me say it, let me say it this way. You can just walk from here down to the end of the street and encounter people and you say, I don't know how I can love these folks. But God, knowing all of what we're capable of, knowing all the ways we have let each other down and let God down, the hurt we've done to each other, the killing, the violence, the oppression, the ways that we just just can't seem to get it right, And God still said, I want to be with you. I want to be with you. I want to be with you. And so that means that you and you and you and all of us and any of us hold the same place that Mary holds, that God favors and may just want to choose you for God's purposes. Oh, I know it sounds far-fetched, but pastor, I I did some horrible things just last night. (laughs) But God, you and you and Any of us and all of us remain the people, the ones through whom God will do what God wants to do. Because when God became God with us, God was manifesting a love. You see what I mean? It didn't matter how much we failed. 
It didn't matter how, how we fall short all the time. God loves us and chose to be with us. And so before we dismiss any of us, or ourselves or anybody else, before we decide that, oh, that can't be the one, or she can't be the one, or no, not him. Remember Mary and Elizabeth, a girl too young to be pregnant and a woman too old, that God said, these are the very ones through whom I will work my will. That's love alive. May it be so for you. Amen.